Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Cup Duet Reviews, brought to you by Cup of Hemlock Theater. I will be your host for this episode, Ryan Barakovich, co-artistic producer here at Cup of Hemlock, and I'm joined today by someone who longtime viewers of The Cup needs no introduction. Andrew Poaru, you've been on so many episodes in the past. How are you doing today? I'm well, and I'm excited to be on this episode. I've never done a duet, so that's this is true. Be a only, new fun experience. That's right. I forgot you've only been on larger panel episodes, yeah. so I'm so happy to have you on this one. It's a show that I know you have a lot to say about, so we're very excited <laughs> to have you talk about the show we're reviewing today, which is Neptune Theater and Mervish's co-production of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead by Tom Stoppard. It is directed by the artistic director of Neptune Theater, Jeremy Webb, and is starring Dominic Monaghan and Billy Boyd, best known as Marion Pippin from Lord of the Rings, as the eponymous Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And it is currently running for a few more days uh, at the Toronto's CAA Theater, part of the Mervish family of theaters, until April 6th, which is the result of an extension. We are actually planning on getting this episode out after the end of the run, but now you have a few more days to see it, April 6th, 2024, so... If you think what we have to say sounds interesting, rush out and get your tickets while you still can. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to dive into this production that you, I correct me if I'm wrong, you've seen this twice now. I have seen production. it twice, yeah. Well, okay, so I'm sure your thoughts will be very robust. But before we get into hearing them, I have to ask our favorite icebreaker question. What is in your cup today? I'm playing it very lame. In my Superman mug, all I have is water. <laughs> okay, there's nothing lame about Superman staying hydrated. <laughs> uh, as for me, I have in my The Cup Cup. Hey, that's the show very I'm watching nice right now. Day. I just have coffee because we're recording this in the morning. So <laughs> get a nice cup of joe, start of the day. Good start, good start. Okay, so because the run is still ongoing, we're going to do a bit of a non-spoiler section at the beginning of this episode. So if you haven't seen it yet and are debating whether or not to see it, a lot of these first few things we say are going to try to avoid spoilers. This is an old play, so there's probably very little that can be spoiled, but we don't necessarily want to get too much into detail. So yeah, before we put up the spoiler shield, Andrew, I'll toss this first question to you. It's an interesting Maybe a bit of a tough one for this show, but how would you describe this play to someone who's never heard of it before, given the kind of non-spoiler plot description, if you will? Yeah, it's certainly a little difficult to do a non-spoiler version, mm -hmm. given how old the play is and how much older the play that it's based on is. Mm -hmm. But it is essentially that it is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern's comedic, absurdist perspective of the events that are taking place as they maneuver their way through the plot of Hamlet. That's kind of how I would describe I it in a sentence. Yeah. yeah, that's very efficient. I think good job. Thank you. Another, <laughs> yeah, another way that I often hear people describe the show, which I think is sort of apt, is it's waiting for Godot meets Hamlet, so to oh, speak. Oh, that's that, really good. Yeah, yes. that is uh, yeah. what if these two side characters from Hamlet that, you know, are very interchangeable with each other and don't have very defined personalities are living out a plot similar to Waiting for Godot, but that yeah. plot is them waiting to make their entrances and exits in Hamlet and the kind of absurdity of life that fills the margins uh, amid all of that. That's so, a really good description. Yeah. yeah. So I think that we did a good job. If that sounds interesting to you, if you've never heard about this before, there is a pretty famous film version of this uh, from 1990. Tom Stoppard himself actually directed it with uh, Gary Oldman and Tim Roth as the, the titular duo, which is maybe one day we will do an episode of our screenplay subseries here on the cup. And Andrew, we'd love to have you back for that. If we do it. Part of that. I, I really enjoy yeah. the film. Yeah, I, I enjoy the film a lot, too. Part of, I think, my thoughts about this production are maybe colored by my love of the film and Super love for this play. Fair. Had you encountered this play? Uh, so you said you've seen the film, but have you read the play before? What's your experience or background with this play before this production? Uh, I read the play. I think uh, we read it in university, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. Um, but I'd forgotten basic, like I'd forgotten it, uh, or the details of it, rather. And I made a point to myself, considering uh, that I had planned to see it twice uh to not watch the film because mm -hmm. uh, and especially since i uh was invited to do this a uh, duet mm -hmm. recording i was like okay i just want to go in watch the production get my thoughts on that and then after that i'll watch the film okay, and perfect. see how 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 the <laughs> how the two compare so but i really enjoy both so yes okay. it'll be interesting it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an interesting, interesting comparison yes. yes okay well before yeah we don't even need to frame this as a comparison but let's get into this production so what were yeah. your general or overall appraisals and thoughts about this production would you recommend it to others 
I absolutely would. I mean, I've seen it twice. So <laughs> I mean, it'd be really strange <laughs> if, if I went, yeah, you know what? I don't want to see it again. And then went. I thought it was very funny. I thought it was a interesting take on an old play. I thought it was very pretty <laughs> without going into spoilers. It was very pretty. And I had a genuinely good time. I was kind of worried going in the first time I had seen it because I knew how old the play was. And I'm not the biggest fan of absurdist theater, mm -hmm. but I thought that the production managed to make it very fresh and bring a new energy into, into the play. So yeah, I would definitely recommend it to okay. anyone who's at least curious about mm -hmm. the play and who definitely wants to see Merry and Pippin from The Hobbit. Yes. <laughs> yes. Or rather, Lord of the Rings. Yes. <laughs> but yes. No, I, I think, yeah, it's definitely those two big stars are a big part of the cell here. We'll get more into their performances Absolutely. in a moment. Probably after the spoiler. Yeah, yeah. Regarding, so I'm glad to hear you had such enthusiastic feelings about it uh, because... I had decidedly mixed feelings about this production, I'm yeah. not going to lie, and, <laughs> and that's the thing. So uh, Mac Mackenzie Horner, my co-host of The Cup, he and I saw it together, and uh, I know he doesn't like absurdist theater at all, so I was surprised that he even wanted to see it. But he's like, <laughs> well, of course I want to see Miriam Pippin, so that, again, the big celebrity draw there. And I love the play, so I was excited to see it. But then I kind of, I had very mixed feelings about this production. I, we can get into it more on the technical side as we go on, but I felt like to me, most of my issues about it came down to the pace. I really think that this is a show that needs to go at a very fast right. clip. And a lot of the times I did feel like it was a bit of a slog. I'm not going to lie. I know a lot of, you know, various people in the theater industry, colleagues, uh, sometimes have their guns out for very long shows. And this is a very long show. It runs almost three hours with two intermissions. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally, I don't feel that way, that I'm always of the mind that if a show can very easily earn its length if it's good enough. I'm not going to, on principle, dislike something because it's long. But I really don't feel like this production earned its length. I think, yeah, to use the film as an example, again, because that's sort of the most immediate one that someone else could have at their fingertips. The film it just goes through so much quicker, so much more economically, and makes good cuts from the original. And I don't know how copyright-wise that is easy to do with Stoppard's permission to give those uh, permissions to make cuts. Mm -hmm. But it just like moves at such a quick pace because so much of this is like bouncy back and forth duo comedy, very vaudevillian style. I did think as much as I did love our leads, they didn't always like jump on each other's heels right. of our sentences very much. And things did feel like a lot more drawn out than they had to be. Part of me thinks that maybe that's on purpose because so much of Osirtis theater is about feeling the cumbersome weight of time and really just having that you know, we are waiting for something we don't know what and you need to mm -hmm. feel that and I get it but even like I use waiting for Godot as an example that I do find that those plays work really well because you know it's all in the pace and the timing and yes you're waiting but it's the original French title of waiting for Godot would be more is on attendant Godot it more accurately translates to while waiting for Godot so it's less about the waiting itself and more the things you do while you wait mm -hmm. and, and this show I think is no exception to that that I I feel like it you know it's more concerned with making you feel how long it is to wait between the scenes of Hamlet than it is about keeping you entertained keeping themselves entertained while they are doing that act of waiting mm -hmm. and yeah so a, a lot of this to me I think I feel like this is maybe like a slightly mean the way of putting it and apologies, but, and again, I always like being positivity guy on these reviews. So I always feel bad when there's something that I don't love as much as I really wanted to. And this, I think it's the expectation to disappointment ratio is a little kind of coloring a lot of what I'm saying here, but yeah, the slightly mean one sentence review I would say of this is that if this wasn't a live theater experience, but it was a pro shot of this production, I would tell people watch it on 1.5 speed. And I think that would be a much more enjoyable experience. It would go quicker and the jokes would kind of come at a much clippier, fast pace. So it's, yeah, it's yeah, certainly, it's certainly interesting that you say that it, it felt like a, a little bit of a slog every now and again. I think I thought the same thing the first time I saw it. And then I went back again. Mm -hmm. Um, and either I was just kind of expecting the pace or they were just as a company faster. But I agree, there was a, a little bit of a slog the first time I saw it, but I, I, I don't know what it was. But the second time I felt like it went a little faster. And for me, the jokes landed a little better. And the mm -hmm. overall, uh, I'm going to say plot, but uh, plot. Yeah, there's a plot. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's plot enough. 
uh, plot seemed to just kind of gel a little bit more. Mm. So very interesting that the yeah. pacing. I have my theories also, I have to oh. admit, and perhaps not in the best way. I mean, mm. <laughs> might get some hate over it, but I have some theories as to why it may have dragged, but we can get into that okay. a little later. No, but it's good. So based on what you said, like, I, yeah, I definitely... I think there is a psychological phenomenon that happens when you see something twice that the second time will always go faster just because mm -hmm. your brain has like better guideposts of what's coming up and what to expect. Whereas the first time you see anything, like it could feel really long just because yes, you don't know where absolutely. it's going. So yeah, I think certainly this maybe does benefit from a second view at Mervish mm -hmm. ticket prices. I wasn't inclined to do that, especially if I left the first time a little lukewarm, but that's yeah. uh, neither here nor there. And yeah, but I am glad you are generally positive on it because as much as there were certainly things I liked about, and we'll get into those soon, I did think overall I had a bit of a sadly lukewarm impression of it. So it's good. I When I heard you saw it twice, I'm like, great, you'll balance out my opinions and we'll have a, <laughs> a, a more nuanced, two-sided uh, perspective on this. Not a debate, just different perspectives. Absolutely. Because I, I have no interest in convincing you that you're wrong for enjoying it. And I, as I <laughs> don't imagine, I would love if you convinced me, said, brought things to my attention that made me like it more than I did. That's why I seek out criticism criticism of a theater more often than not like For oh sure. i don't know how i felt about that and then someone in a review brings up a good point i'm like oh okay i didn't think about that but that makes sense so okay. hopefully you will maybe pull me to the light side a little more because i don't no love pressure, dwelling no in the darkness <laughs> <laughs> okay so i think that's probably a good place for uh, to end our non-spoiler section, because I think we want to really get into the weeds here. Once again, this is the production of Rosencrantz and Gillen's Turn Are Dead by Tom Stoppard, co-production between Neptune Theatre and Mervish. It is directed by Jeremy Webb and starring Don Nick Monaghan and Billy Boyd as Rosencrantz and Gildenstern, running at the CAA Theatre until April 6th, 2024. If you don't want any spoilers, now's the time to stop watching, because I'm going to flip a coin. Woo! Heads! This, there's now a coin on the wow. screen, and <laughs> that is our spoiler coin for this episode, because everything we say from here on out is spoilers. If you're listening to this as a podcast, you have no idea what I'm talking about. On YouTube, there's a coin on the screen right now that says spoilers. <laughs> so yeah, Max going to do you dirty and just not do that animation? Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Andrew, we are in spoiler zone now. I guess the best place to start here is with our hobbits themselves, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. What did you think of Dominic Monaghan and Billy Boyd's performances as our titular duo? I should preface by saying I was going in looking to be dazzled by them. And it, uh, just with that expectation, I don't think I was disappointed. Okay. I found them both very charming, very, uh, very <laughs> quick, which is interesting. Uh, quick, uh, I think their comedic timing was very good, and I did feel for them uh, at moments where Rosencrantz and or Guildenstern and Guildenstern and or Rosencrantz mm -hmm. were kind of having that existential crisis that mm -hmm. I think Stoppard's play is probably best known for. So I definitely went in looking to be charmed, and they were indeed charming. I think the best thing about watching Billy Boyd and Dominic Monaghan on stage is it's very clear that they're friends, which I think adds to their performance in general, but also to the relationship that Guildenstern and Rosencrantz have, because I think those two are feeling very much alone in the world except for each other. Which I, And that relationship that Dominic Monaghan and Billy Boyd have really add to that. And I, you know, just watching them kind of go through the nonsense that is the behind the scenes of Hamlet's plays, even within Hamlet's play, it's made all the more funnier or all the more funny and you feel for them even more, I find. But yeah, so so in summary, I was very pleased with their performance. Uh, I watched it twice for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> That's good. No, okay. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because I agree. Like as down as I maybe seemed on this production a moment ago, it is really the two of them that I think is not only it's saving grace, but is the reason to see this, that they are incredible. I love what you said about you can sense a genuine friendship between them, not just as characters, but as actors. And it makes sense. We've seen them be friends in the Hobbit hole in the Shire <laughs> um, in, the, in the past. So it really, yeah, but yeah, it's, you do feel that. And the, the history that these characters share, the dynamic, even if I didn't necessarily think that the comic timing was always as stellar as I would have hoped, they, they did still have a funny, awkward comic energy that really did suit the piece as well. Uh, I think they were very, even though these characters are famously interchangeable, I do think they were well cast in their respective roles, mm -hmm. that there was 
a, a bit more Billy Boyd as the more sort of intellectual Guildenstern um, really did kind of bring that energy, very good foil to Dominic Monaghan's more like silly, zanier, I guess, Estragon to a Vladimir type mm-hmm. dynamic mm-hmm. or which and even like going back to Waiting for Godot, I feel like I'm bringing up Waiting for Godot a lot. But even that is go like, figure, yeah. <laughs> go figure. But yeah, even like, you know, that classic dynamic is crib from so many different vaudeville acts, you know, Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello, like mm-hmm. there is. Uh, this kind of tradition of, uh, you know, comic duos that these types of Osiris sort of figures are usually modeled after. And I think they did a good job of that. And that's a difficult needle to thread when the most famous thing about these characters prior to Stopper is that they are interchangeable, that there's the funny line in Hamlet, which is replicated in this show as well, where Claudius is like gentle Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and Gertrude says gentle G- Guildenstern and Rosencrantz. So in every production of Hamlet always does it that Claudius got it wrong, which one is which, and Gertrude has to correct it. So that's the thing about these characters. So the fact that they are imbued with individualism that you can really get a sense of which one's which and how they engage with the world differently. One is always heads, the other is always tails. They are two sides of the same coin, but nonetheless different sides of that coin. So I, I, yeah, I thought they did an excellent job and it is, like I said, the reason to see this show more than anything. Cool. But they aren't the only ones on stage, remember, and there is still a whole ensemble cast So I guess the next question I'd like to ask is, what did you think of the rest of the ensemble? And were there any actors or actors in particular who you'd like to give a special shout out to? For sure. I thought the ensemble was very, very good. I especially, (laughs) we're we're in spoiler mode, right? Yes, please. Especially the scene where they're essentially going through the plot of Hamlet in their show, I thought was brilliantly done. I think it's a testament to how tight of a how tight the direction was but also just like how committed that the rest of the ensemble was and they all played multiple roles which i think is like like just very cool because the first time i see it i'm like these are different no 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 no, these guys are in the players they're part of the Mm -hmm. they're part of the players the the, (laughs) i'm gonna get this word right Tragedians. Tragedians, yes. Tragedians, yes, because I was like, I, yeah, even coming out of that, I'm like, I got to get that word right in a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, the first time I was just kind of like, holy cow, I didn't really click into the fact that they were playing two characters and it's just so seamless how they differentiate between them. So I thought they were very, very well uh, performed and just added a very nice layer to bolster the show. Who do I want to give a, a shout out to? Mm-hmm. I mean, obvious. This is probably obvious and a, a a bit of a cop out, but Michael Blake, who is a nine season veteran of the Stratford Festival, playing the player, mm-hmm. is always very fun to watch. I've enjoyed his work from Othello to mm-hmm. when he was Caliban in The Tempest. So I've watched a couple of his performances. I've enjoyed all of them, and this is no exception. So he definitely brings a shake more shakespearean or at least what probably ontarians know as like stratford shakespearean Mm -hmm. kind of energy to the play so it was really cool to see a familiar face in what i expected to be a crowd of actors that i wasn't familiar with that also being said who was it it was i had my program in front of me Mm -hmm. oh sick (laughs) walter borden yes as polonius Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah i made a comment that i wanted to like ursula that guy's voice so cool (laughs) he kind of has this the voice of this actor uh that i saw a recording of uh, an old recording 1967 or something like that of taming of the shrew Mm -hmm. um and he has like and it, like his facial expressions were almost that of like vincent price so every time he walked on stage i was like yeah (laughs) that guy Okay. just let that guy talk more yeah i <laughs> wanted to see polonius talk more <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll piggyback off of that because yeah walter borden was definitely gonna get a shout out for me too i guess you didn't yeah. see earlier in the season that it was actually the season opener at tarragon he had a solo show there called last oh, episode of tightrope time kind of reflecting on his many years of oh, life experience in theater and poetry and activism and yeah he again you hit the nail on his head his voice is magic the way oh. that man speaks and yeah he's just so intelligent and so thoughtful Thoughtful and that show in particular, Last Epistle, is him recounting his life story, patching it together like a quilt. So hearing 
him in his own words is remarkable. I've also like been at events where he's like been a keynote speaker and yeah, he's just such a, a remarkable presence. And then having him play a character like Polonius, who is famously <laughs> foolish and a daughter like that. Yeah, I think he, it, it was, you know, pitch perfect casting in that regard. He, he was so good. And yeah, he, he, he got the assignment very well. It, it's yeah. funny. So you did shout out Michael Blake and I'm glad you did because I, again, I don't want to always be so negative on things. I, I have also seen Michael Blake be very good in many shows, usually tragedies. And despite being a tragedian in this, I didn't feel like he nailed the comedy, unfortunately. And that's hey, the thing. Like, in most, yeah, and in, in most of like, yes, I thought he was a remarkable Othello in the, the Stratford production from mm-hmm. like 2018. I, I've seen him be good in a lot of things. I can't say I've seen him in a lot of comedies before this. And the player role does have to anchor a lot of the humor. In this show, uh, Richard Dreyfus, I believe, played him in the film version, and he's mm-hmm. a very kind of um, remarkable presence, very comedic in that as well. But yeah, I, I did feel like there was a bit of a, so often there was maybe, and it was different than your audiences, and the audience brings its own different energy when you saw it, but there was a lot of awkward pauses where Michael Blake is making a joke and it was just like dead silence. And I didn't feel, and like the other members of the ensemble didn't necessarily like pick up on that quickly enough. So it just felt, I don't want to say cringy, but there was a bit of a, right. a dead, deadness hanging in the air. And unfortunately, yeah, I just think I, a great tragic actor. I don't know if he has the comedy chops for this role, in my opinion. I and I think the one other comedy that I can recall seeing him in was Mary Wives of Windsor at Stratford, which he had a pretty small role in. It was the same season that he was playing Othello. So he was, yeah, I think Mistress Page's husband, or if I recall correctly, we reviewed that. Maybe it's showing up on the screen here if you're watching this on YouTube. <laughs> he was good in that, and he kind of played like a funny dweeby foil to his Othello track from that same year. But he, the jokes weren't hinged on him nailing them in that production as much. He's not. He wasn't playing Falstaff. So, yeah, I I was sadly a little disappointed with him in here, even though I think for a lot of, as you said, Ontarian Shakespeare or Stratford aficionados, he probably was similarly a draw for this performance. People wanted to see him in it. And to me, I don't feel like he really landed a lot of it. And yeah, I was a little disappointed and felt unfortunate about that. Someone else I do want, unless you want to, before I shout someone else out, do you want to say anything in his defense? Because I, I don't let me have the last word on that. I, I defend him insofar as I still maintain that he brought a Shakespearean energy, which I sure. think is a good um, kind of contrast to the like casual, quick Dominic Monaghan and Billy Boyd. However, mm-hmm. I do agree that sometimes I think because he was bringing that energy that his punchlines and he has a lot of the punchlines didn't land as hard as I think it could have if there was somebody who was a little quicker and Mm -hmm. I don't know what the word would be for it but yeah I think I just like punchier maybe punchier that is a great word punchier in in delivery although I did like the Hamlet's in Mm -hmm. love with the old man's daughter the old man (laughs) yes Oh yeah, and there were great jokes. And I'm not saying that like everything he did fell flat. There was no, 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 absolutely not. Overall, I just yeah, I don't think, in my opinion, it didn't feel like he had the comic chops for this role that really does carry a lot of the comedy in this very funny play. Absolutely, and and he's probably, uh, as I kind of alluded to earlier, I think he's maybe the reason, or for me, he was one of the reasons I thought that the play dragged a little Mm -hmm. because. They're Dominic Monaghan and Billy Boyd are very, very quick in their deliveries. They talk really, really fast. Michael Blake, again, Stratford energy, which is great, but also the pacing drops a little bit. And I think Um, it also comes down to what you alluded to earlier about how uh, Dominic and Billy have this longtime friendship energy. mm -hmm. He's the newcomer to this trio. And so much of the play is them as a trio. Even when the rest of the ensemble and the players are present, it's really the three of them talking to each other. mm -hmm. And yeah, so it makes sense that he doesn't necessarily have that same quickness and, you know, history and rapport with them that they have when it's just the two of them together. And I, I won't fault him for that. It's, oh, he should have also not. been in Lord yeah. of the Rings and then he would yeah. have had that long-standing <laughs> friendship. But yeah, I'm sure he would have loved that. But yeah, uh, yeah just sadly <laughs> isn't the case here. One la- Another shout out I do want to give, I won't say one last because I might have one more, but the actor who played Hamlet in this, I have his name here, Pasha er- Erbahimi, apologies if I'm mispronouncing anybody's name, but I thought he was really remarkable and He was a very interesting interpretation of Hamlet because he was so gruff and growly and intimidating most of the time. 
And it's the kind of thing I realized what I thought was so magnetic about it is that you couldn't get away with a performance like that in an actual production of Hamlet. Absolutely. Because yeah. you have to like Hamlet or else it doesn't work. And he was like a tornado, like every time he was on stage. And like you couldn't empathize or sympathize with him if, if he was the lead in a production of Hamlet. But it was so perfect for this show where our lead isn't Hamlet, but Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And to them, Hamlet would be this force of nature that just like sweeps them up, literally causes their death. Spoilers in the title, but we're yeah. past spoilers here. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, like <laughs> it, it was a, such a perfect Hamlet for this play, not for mm. Hamlet in general, but I thought, yeah, his... Yeah, the way he just like grumbled and growled and everything he did was like so like eerie. And it really shows this is what Hamlet would look like from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern's perspective when they don't get to hear his soliloquies and get into his mental state and sympathize with what he's going through, all of the mental angst he's under that. Yeah, this is just from the outside looking in. Hamlet is a scary dude. And I think he pulled that off perfectly. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I it's an, it's good that you bring that up because I sat beside a person who was in love with Pasha and like his performance and I was there like really that's the first thing you're gonna you know, all right why <laughs> no I didn't but I didn't ask for it yeah although he has the he has that great voice he does um, <laughs> he has that booming voice for Hamlet so it's, but I'm glad you bring it up because it kind of enlightens me into like okay why did people was were people drawn to him and I think I got too stuck on the fact that I was like this is a weird Hamlet mm -hmm. um because I couldn't fathom this Hamlet being in Hamlet but that's a very interesting perspective that's not mm -hmm. meant to be the case it's Hamlet in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern mm -hmm. are dead looking at it from that perspective I'm Oh, that actually makes perfect sense because he mm -hmm. does come across as just this like destructive, scary force. Um, so yes, thank you for thank you for shouting him out. That definitely sets right a kind of questionable, not questionable, but like an oddity of the overall mm -hmm. production in my head. I think that makes perfect sense. Oh, well, happy to help. <laughs> like, yes, I, I love it. Even if I was the one who was more lukewarm on this production, I'm still able to make you enjoy it even more. Yes. I love this <laughs> it works out for me. <laughs> okay, one last very quick shout out that I'll give is Raquel mm -hmm. Duffy, who plays Gertrude, who really isn't in it a lot. But a part of why I shout her out, like, one, she's a you know a veteran of the Canadian stage, seen her in a lot of productions. Most recently, she was inappropriate at Coal Mine. Excellent performance she gave in that. But part of why I shout her out, which I think this is funny, because, again, she's not in this show. Gertrude is such a minor character in this play about the minor characters from Hamlet. But I just think it's funny that between seeing the show and us now doing this recording... Can Stage announced their upcoming season, and she is going to be in their Shakespeare Dream in High Park production of Hamlet, and I believe she is playing Gertrude again. So That's funny <laughs> to go from playing Gertrude in Rosie Crazy Guildenstern to doing it in Can Stage at Shakespeare in High Park. I think that's yes, I will love to see her flourish and shine more in that because you know she's perhaps done a little dirty in this production where Gertrude <laughs> is certainly a minor role, the mm -hmm. role reversal of who is major or minor. Maybe we'll talk more about that soon. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> okay so i think is there any, anything else with the cast you want to say or have we done a good rinse of everyone yeah, I, think, to address? I, I think so yes mm -hmm. i have nothing negative to say about anybody except for apparently michael blake's pacing so i don't want okay. that yeah. and like again i'm not trying to talk you out of things you enjoy no 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 no, no i'm with you i'm yeah. with you <laughs> okay apologies to michael blake if you're watching we loved your othello literally <laughs> great othello like <laughs> Okay, so I guess the next thing we should probably talk about, that was the acting, but there's a lot of other stuff on the stage. So is there any kind of production or design element you'd like to give a shout out to? The toss up for me with this, was it either the costumes or the set? Mm -hmm. I'm because... going to talk about the set. So you talk... before I even saw like the first before I saw this production for the first time, I think the thing that like drew me and excited me the most was uh, seeing a Neptune Theater's like Instagram of the production. And just looking at how stunning the costume was, especially, I have to admit, especially Michael Blake's costume, mm -hmm. that like that feathered coat robe, I don't know what necessarily to call it, but like was like stunning every time Michael Blake came on stage. He has a presence in and of itself, but coming with that coat, I was just like, oh, that's a mood. That's an energy. <laughs> how beautiful those costumes were. Yeah. So yes, I definitely have to give my one of my 
at the very least, one of my favorite uh, uh, design elements to uh, costuming. So well done to if you want to talk i'm going to find uh, the yeah kaylin mcdonald is the costume yes. designer i have it here so so yes excellent job there i would agree with all that uh the player has a fun line about how like i'm always in costume yeah. or i'm always <laughs> ready i forget the exact phrasing but so yes. yeah the fact that the costume does it is alluded to directly it has to make a statement and the mm -hmm. design certainly did pull that off the set design done by andrew cull i is what the thing that i really wanted to talk about and there's a few elements of it. There's the kind of skeletal risers that are very malleable and get moved a lot. The image of them on the boat together with the rest of the company oh, rocking it. So very good. good. Yeah, if you're going to have to get a boat on stage, like that's a, an excellent so way clever. of pulling it off. Yeah, so I thought that was great. And on the subject of boats, the big curtains that we had on there that simultaneously evoke the sails of the pirate ship and the curtains for the player's theater it was like this perfect bit of, you know, rapid duck optical illusion kind of thing that it was the same thing in every context, but the meaning changed depending on what was going on stage. And mm -hmm. I just thought it was a perfect way of evoking all of that. And so much of this play is very meta theatrical. We have as much like how Hamlet is very meta theatrical that we do have this troupe of actors on stage and having this thing that doesn't look like a, a luxurious red velvet theater curtain, but does look like the kind of scrappy theater curtain that this traveling group of players would have that then seems like it could very well be made of the masts of a ship. Who knows what mm -hmm. like this ragtag band puts together to make their makeshift productions. Uh, I thought that was just such a, a beautiful image that was on stage for so much of it and really did uh, evoke so many different things. So that's where my shout out, Andrew Cull, the set design go. Anything you want to say about yeah. the set that I didn't? Oh, I just I I love the fact that they that uh, Andrew Call and us I think there was an assistant set designer okay. Lucas Arab. Okay, yeah, yes, I think so. I'll also shout out that because uh, I don't know who did what. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we cannot speak to the division of labor behind the exactly, scenes. Exactly, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but one of one of my favorite things was the fact that it looked like the backstage of a theater. Mm -hmm. There were there was a fly system in the back. There were sand weighted sandbags above mm -hmm. the stage which was at one point manipulated <laughs> and faced a curtain which i thought was brilliant and i think it just adds to this meta theatricality of rosencrantz and gildenstern are dead because we essentially get a look behind the curtain mm -hmm. at what rosencrantz and gildenstern are doing when everyone else is on stage doing something else when hamlet is happening i thought that was just a very clever nod to the plot and the play um and it just made it everything so just as a whole, the set was just very adaptable. It's simple, but not without the ability to change from one thing to the other, as you had said. Mm -hmm. So yes, I will. I think you summarized it very, very well. Well, yeah. And I love that you use the word backstage because I think yeah, I neglected to put it in those terms, but that is such an apt way of putting it. And it is, yeah, this play has big backstage energy. It yes. is really about what do these characters do when they're not on stage? And mm -hmm. yeah, I think it, that the set definitely did evoke a lot of that feeling and the, the fact that we are literally peeking behind the curtain in that way does uh, yeah chef's kiss Mwah, it's so yeah, perfect yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay i feel like i've already answered this next question and if you don't feel like you have anything to add we can skip it but do you would you say that you had a weakest element of this production anything that you feel like didn't quite hit the mark for you i know that we kind of alluded to pacing however mm -hmm. i do have to and i'm gonna apologize in advance to lighting desire leanne uh, vardy mm -hmm. I think that was the thing that I was always struggling to overcome, even though it was beautiful. I found a lot of the play to be very dark, mm -hmm. especially in the beginning. I was kind of questioning. I'm like, do I need to go to the optometrist? Like, <laughs> why can't I see anything? <laughs> Which I think was a great design in theory, in the sense of giving like that shadowy, we're behind the curtain. We're only getting aspects of light. But for me, practically speaking, I found it like I was really having a hard time actually seeing what was on stage every now and again. I was like, mm -hmm. can we just get, can we get, can we just turn it up a little bit? Maybe I'm getting old. So mm, I'm going to put that out there. It's but, just, that's a possibility for me. But also yeah. I was just like, I wanted, it's not that the design <laughs> was weak. It's just that like, I wanted more lights. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I think I feel you on that. That actually didn't really register to me as an issue. But now that you're bringing it up, I'm like, yeah, I kind of, without realizing it sort of did feel the same way. Again, not against the designer, just that it is sort of a darkness. 
And also, once again, comparing it to the film version, there's the film is very bright. It is yes. like quite shiny. And uh, uh, yeah, not shiny in like uh, an opulent or luxurious way, but it's just set in daylight most of the time. And mm-hmm. it's kind of interesting that this is the the comedic foil to the tragedy of Hamlet, so much of which is set at nighttime. And there's a lot of things of like, oh, the ghost appears at night and et cetera, et cetera, that it is kind of nice that this is basically a satyr play variation on Hamlet, that the, that there, it, it would make sense that there should be lights, that they aren't living out a tragedy, even though it literally ends with their death, that right. this is a, the comedy should exist in broad daylight and you get to see though the warts and all, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I do think that there's maybe a little too much cloaked in tragic shadows and mystery that maybe doesn't really suit what this play is doing as well. And that's unfortunate. Like on one sense, I will maybe defend the lighting in that it had, perhaps evoked like a dreamlike sort of yes, uh, nocturnal energy, but I don't know if that necessarily is the best choice or suited exactly what this show does so well or what the vibes that it wants to evoke, because it does make it feel maybe a bit more grim and somber than it deserves to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a very good point. It did, it did definitely evoke this kind of ethereal, like, kind of energy to it i will definitely give it that but uh yes i did i I still maintain that i wanted more light so this is not like the thing that i didn't like it was just the thing that i liked least okay that's fair (laughs) totally valid (laughs) okay so yeah we kind of we've done a good sweep of the technical elements of this production let's just talk a little more dramaturgically about some interesting things and i guess just from a historical bent, we could address the fact that Stoppard first wrote this play in 1966, which is a long time ago. Yeah. Do you feel that this play is still relevant or resonant today as it maybe was back then when we were both alive and clearly saw the original production? Yes, but, of so, <laughs> Nonetheless, how do you feel like it speaks to the present moment, perhaps, or does it still speak in the same way you imagine it might have been? I don't I, I don't feel confident in saying that it speaks the same way as it did back then, but I would hazard a guess to say that it kind of does because I think the themes that kind of address that it addresses this longing for purpose and not really knowing where life's going and being, or at least feeling that you're kind of swept up in the action as Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are really, I think it is kind of universal in the, the kind of human experience. We're all kind of put on this big blue marble with barely any beginning and no clear end in sight well there is an end it's just not clear it's It's in the title (laughs) it's in the title yes (laughs) so you know especially having seen it for the first time and feeling like that resonated with me i can definitely say that it still has at least some effects whether that effect is the same i'm not too sure we're you know there could be like thoughts on like how religious you can get with that and the idea of as the player said we're kind of going with the idea that we're being watched, which makes which gives purpose to that. Whereas I think, you know, 2024 compared to 1966, maybe that's something that bothers people less. We're all being watched all the time by our yes, devices exactly. in our pockets. <laughs> yeah, exactly that too. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, you know, there's certain things I can say to that. However, uh, I still think as a whole, it, it definitely, I think, registers with a lot of people that like, life's very strange and sometimes things around us are more in control than we are and it begins to feel a little silly we kind of got to make sense of it and go with it and sometimes it doesn't go the way we want it to go but yes so i in that regard i think that it does still have some very significant meaning in today's today's theater scene yeah yeah no i think that's pretty fair and yeah i would agree for the most part there is like a lot of just you know, universal is not a word I like using very often, but timeless maybe is a good way of putting a a lot of this. Yeah, Yeah, because, you know, even just like the little funny things that they converse about over the course of it, you know, what's the the longest ago thing you remember? I don't remember. No, not the earliest memory you've ever had. What's the, if you go back to your memories, what's the first thing you remember? (laughs) And like, or the, you know, I always trim my fingernails, but never trim my toenails. toenails. (laughs) (laughs) Which like, you must have to trim them sometimes. Yes, I get that it's less frequent than the bigger nails <laughs> but yeah just like little things like that like i don't think these things will ever get old or unless we invent some technology to not have to trim our fingernails anymore that these things yes. will continue to be <laughs> resonant in a lot of way and yeah just spending time with them as they have these funny conversations like you can get a kick out of this at any point whether it's 1960 when the play was new 1990 when the film came out or 2024 now they still hit in a lot of the same ways 
I, I'm going to have a nerdier answer, I guess, to this about just situating the theater of the absurd in moment in, I guess, that theater history trajectory, because Waiting for Godot is from like the, the mid 50s, I, I want to say 50, 56 or but so about a decade before this. And those, I guess, who are maybe less familiar with this didn't go to theater school or didn't have good theater history education listening. Theater of the Absurd isn't a movement the way that surrealism was a movement or futurism or the kind of avant-garde isms where a bunch of artists who were disenchanted with the aesthetic status quo got together, wrote a manifesto and said, this is what we do that's differently. Theater of the Absurd was something that Various post-World War II playwrights were writing plays that were very different from the status quo, but they weren't necessarily even friends with each other. They didn't get together and create an aesthetic agenda. They were just writing these very strange plays. And that was starting to become a more common appearance that in 1961, a theater scholar named Martin Eslin wrote a book called Theater of the Absurd, where he took these new developments by playwrights like Samuel Beckett and Eugene Ionesco and Jean Genet, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole list of them and said that I think I figured out what all of these playwrights have in common and why they're so different from previous models of theater. And the term he used to describe that was theater of the absurd, which he took from Albert Camus and the absurdist philosophy, which was Camus' own derivative of the existentialist philosophy that Jean-Paul Sartre was putting up. But the, the big kind of kicker was that these are plays that don't talk about how absurd life is in any sort of realist formal terms, but they demonstrate the absurdity of life through absurd means of form and storytelling. So it's not a character sitting around talking about their philosophies, it's just by watching it you encounter philosophy by seeing it. And that was what made these plays so different from plays written by Sartre and Camus, both of whom were playwrights and philosophers, but they wrote very talky plays where people expound their philosophies, where you don't really get that in uh, Beckett, Ionesco. Sorry, I'm lecturing a little bit here. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying it. This is stuff that I haven't heard in a bit, so right. I'm not, not in my memory, so this is, I'm just soaking this in. Yeah, so, so in 1961, Eslin publishes this book, and most of the absurdist playwrights don't necessarily disavow it, so to speak, but they're saying like, sure, you can describe our work however we want, but don't retroactively turn this into a movement. It's not what we're doing, but you as a critic are well within your rights to describe it in whatever terms you want. But it often gets uh, thought of as this prescriptive movement when it was more just a descriptive label that was put on to make sense of what these plays were doing. And so that came out in 1961. So I think Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead is an interesting flashpoint where we're only a decade out from the birth of this movement toward absurdism, not necessarily an absurdist movement. So it's still very much in the raw newness of that, but it came out after we had a word for it or a label, a language to describe that. So it's not in that first wave of we're all disoriented after the war. This is the only way we can make sense of our situation. So we're going to write weird plays about the absurdity of life. But it is very much, I think, as far as I'm aware, and I could be wrong about this historically, but it kind of is the first or at least first famous example that is, I think, self-consciously being a theater of the absurd. I would be very surprised if Stoppard didn't read Eslin's book before writing this play. And, it, you know, and obviously he is very influenced by Beckett, but I don't think he's influenced just by Beckett on his own terms. He's influenced by the discourse of Beckett's scholarship that had already begun to accrue at this point. And he's very interested in, I'm going to write a play that someone like Martin Eslin could describe as theater of the absurd, which isn't what Beckett and Ionesco and Janet were doing at the time. They were just writing the plays that made sense to them in the senselessness of it all. So... Why I go on this, I guess, long historical tangent here is because I think theater of the absurd has become so sublimated into our culture, whether people are familiar with the term or, or know a lot or know any of the other plays or playwrights that I'm talking about. It's become sort of just something through pop culture osmosis that we're very familiar with. The original audience for Waiting for Godot was baffled by what even is this play? I don't know what to make of it. And now we read it and like it's kind of commonplace. We're like, okay, yeah, I get it. They're waiting for this other guy who doesn't show up. He's not going to come. What? Well, that's the situation. 
And, <laughs> you know, there's all kinds of pop culture things. I, one of my favorite examples is like the Chinese restaurant episode from Seinfeld is basically a, a parody of waiting for a show <laughs> where they're just waiting for a table for the whole 30 minute episode. Of, uh, you know, there's a line from Buffy the Vampire Slayer in one episode of, man, that girl makes Godot seem punctual. So th there's enough sense that people are aware of these things that it's not going to shock us the same way that it shocked its original audience. Mm -hmm. And I, I think Stoppard was writing in a moment where he, it was kind of best of both that he could still shock people with, you know, you thought you were seeing a Hamlet thing, but you're basically seeing a Beckett thing. Ha ha, I fool you. But at the same time, there was enough early discourse on it that people weren't baffled at what they were watching because there was a language to describe it. And mm. now we still have that language to describe it, but so many other things have happened, so many different parodies and reimaginings and post 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 modern interpretations of various things like the absurdist theater that I don't know if it hits the same way. It's still entertaining and funny and has those timeless elements, but yeah, I think it it's a very much a product of its time that as certain parts of it still feel very resonant. I don't know if the whole necessarily does. And I say that as someone who loves it to death. And and maybe this production also is making me a little disenchanted by things that I love about it on the page or in the film. I've never, this is the first time actually seeing a non-film production of the play. So, but I was hoping to be like, yes, this is everything I've ever wanted. Mary and Pippin are in this play that I love. <laughs> and I, the fact that I left it with like a meh feeling, it makes me think that maybe this product of its times, time is passing a little bit or it doesn't feel as prescient as it maybe did in its own day. Sorry, I've thrown a lot at you. Anything you want to comment on? No, any that's that? fair. I like that idea, or I find the idea interesting of how there is a shock value and kind of maybe a novelty about when this play was released versus now. That whereas like a 2024 20, audience just kind of ex like at least maybe even passively knowing about Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead or about the movement towards absurdity, that there is this level of. I guess I think you would use the word shock that is lost. So that's very interesting. I find that something that I didn't realize that I went into this production kind of without of because I know about the play. I know about kind of what the idea be behind uh, what was called the absurdist movement is and kind of what I should expect about uh, what this play is going to kind of address. And it's interesting that it came out after there was a word for de describing it and Stoppard probably went, I can probably meet Beckett's uh, I, I original kind of idea a little bit and put it into this play. So there's something about that expectation that I think I didn't realize that I went in with. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think somebody, it, it would be very interesting of somebody who's never heard, to talk to someone who's never heard, never seen, has no kind of comprehension of what Theater of the Absurd is, what they would say about mm -hmm. this play. Because, yes, that's very, a very good point that, I, that yeah. I, well, I, I just know about this stuff. And therefore, it kind of colors my well, interpretation yeah. of what's coming at me. And perhaps then you and I are the wrong people to be approaching it in this Maybe. way. <laughs> and like I, I used Mac uh, as an example earlier, because he knows that he doesn't like theater of the absurd. So mm -hmm. I was surprised that he wanted to see this show and he left it similarly lukewarm to I, but he had, I guess, a photo negative. I don't want to speak for him. And Mac, when you're editing this, feel free to put an editor's note on the screen if you want to. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, but he had like a photo negative of my opinion. He's like, I love the production. I don't like the play. I'm like, I love the play. I don't know if I love this production. Right. And so, yeah, I think, yeah, it's having a lot of this baggage and knowledge does certainly inform the way we think about it, the way we receive it. You, you, who did you go with when you saw it both times? And were they people who have this sort of theater history or stylistic knowledge that maybe would have informed their view? Yes, they were. I think one El Nino, who I met them through the Show Must Go Online. I'm just going to send some plugs. Nice. Yes. Plugs their we way. Can, we uh, can put that on the screen as well. Show Must Go Online. Great. Great series. Yes, great. Fantastic. <laughs> Check out El. They're very lovely. Very, very well informed and versed in theater and Stoppard and Theater of the Absurd. Alex Verge, who I met in Toronto Fringe. I'm sure they also have an Instagram or something that I can plug, but I don't know it off the top of my head. But also check out Alex Verge. Familiar with theater, but I don't believe they're familiar with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. So very different. And I found that, or they had expressed to me, 
Al had expressed that they liked it a little bit less than I think Alex expressed that they liked it. Interesting. So to your point, so, I think having that lack of knowledge hell because right. the like I would assume L kind of going I expected one thing given this knowledge and I didn't get it hmm. okay so mm-hmm. take of that what you will yeah person watching this post spoiler who maybe is also not as early to still at this point deciding whether or not to see it but maybe also left it not sure what they thought and wants a panoply of different opinions and yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's like, you get them all you get <laughs> <Yeah>. them all folks <laughs> Well, speaking of other people's opinions on this, so I typically, as a rule, when we're reviewing something on the cup, I don't read any reviews or other people's reviews until after we've recorded our episode, because I don't want to, you know, crib other people's ideas or take anything from theirs. Uh, But because this one originally, it was planned that this wasn't going to come out until after the run was over, I I cheated and I did do something that I usually do. I'm also the kind of person, I feel like I've maybe said this on episodes before, where I very rarely read reviews to decide what to see. Mm -hmm. I read reviews after I've seen it to just, yeah, continue the discussion in my head, basically, and have these types of cup discussions and get other people's stances on things and see if maybe something I didn't like clicks better with and someone else puts it in better language. So Liam Donovan, who often writes for Next Magazine and Intermission Magazine, you know, a friend of the show, he's he wrote a review for Next Magazine that was one of the more, you know, negative reviews that I've encountered. And it was happy for me to see that because most of the reviews were overwhelmingly positive and I'm like I think I'm missing something here (laughs) and then I read Liam's and Liam is a a very talented critic and somebody who I I highly respect and I value his opinions don't always agree with them but uh, when I read his review in Next Magazine which we'll maybe link at the bottom of this episode for people to check out I was like okay yes someone's putting into words a lot of the things that I'm less negative on or that I'm more negative on in this production and he had a you know funny headline for his review that the production hobbles with Hobbit to the finish line and what we <laughs> but uh, yeah I, I don't know I, I sent you the link I don't know if you had a chance to read it before I, 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 I did and I saw that I'm like oof <laughs> yeah but it, it was cathartic for me to read his review because it, it, you know he was saying a lot of the things I was thinking so uh, you know if there's any comparison between his stance and mine in here that's not me subconsciously stealing <laughs> from him apologies Liam if you're watching but uh, that is just that yeah we kind of had similar views in this regard And he had an interesting sort of stinger at the end of his review that got me thinking. It wasn't something that had occurred to me. And I I put it in this terms to give him credit for thinking of this. I don't want it to seem like this was my brilliant idea. But he kind of posed an interesting question in his review that I'll, I'll quote it directly here. He says, quote, how can the show dramatize the plight of being a minor character when the casting itself frames them as major? End quote. In other words, that the celebrity casting of Dominic Monaghan and Billy Boyd might risk undercutting the themes of the play, presenting these minor characters of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern as being anything but marginal when they're the famous faces that get people into the theater to see this show. I, I'm very curious if you have thoughts, Andrew, on this or this observation. Do you agree with it? Disagree? Did it get your mind going in any particular way? It certainly got my mind going because I didn't really think of it as, you know, kind of spoiling that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are the minor characters. Because for me, by definition, going to see a play called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead with them being the leads, I think in and of itself kind of sets them up as they are not the marginal character. The joke is that they are, Mm -hmm. I think. And I have a hard time with this observation simply because so many inter- like productions of this play have been done with names that I think I might be just numb to that. And I go, well, that's just kind of like how people go to the theater sometimes is they see a name and they go, yeah, let's go see that one. Because, yeah, there is a Daniel Radcliffe version. There's mm-hmm. the movie version with two big names mm-hmm. or three big names, rather, and yeah. Stoppard himself directing it. Um So I'm kind of like, I don't necessarily think that it's so detrimental to Mm -hmm. the play or how one would interpret the play that it's um, something that like I'm I'm gonna, you know, lose sleep over. I think Mm -hmm. it's a very good point. And something that I didn't think of. But having thought about it, I kind of just I I shrug my shoulders and I go, 
they're actors. They just happen to be famous actors. I think I, I personally rather a famous actor who does it well than a no 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 name actor who does it okay. Mm-hmm. Then again, there are no no name actors, quote unquote, who do it fantastically. Yes, however. and and then don't get the same crowds to see them doing it fantastically because of their lack of names. Yes, exactly. Yes. yes. So I'll give them that. But I don't know. I I enjoyed Dominic uh, Monaghan and Billy Boyd being in it. I'm glad they were cast, and I think that it brings people in to see a show mm-hmm. that they may not have seen and may go see that person who they didn't who whose name they don't know, but they know the play and they liked the play, so they may see that. I right. think there's a lot of aspects to that. And just from like a kind of, I guess, dramaturgical point of view, it's just, these are the main characters. I am I think the point more so comes from the fact that they're the main characters in a world where they aren't the main characters. Yeah. And we get to see that and we get to hear that kind of, we get to hear and relates to the plight of them going, We don't know what to do. We don't know where we come from. We're just kind of going with the flow and it's not working out in the best kind of way. That's kind of where I stand on it. I don't necessarily, I mean, I guess I, yes, yes. I think I'm disagreeing. Um, Yes, that's fine. The more I'm talking, the more I'm disagreeing. Liam, if you're watching, get in the comment section and disagree with Andrew. Roast Andrew. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, I think you're making a lot of great points. And I definitely do think, yeah, there is an interesting, you know, why I was so compelled by this question that he raised in his review is because, yeah, it is, it does feel in a sense that it goes against the ethos of the play that these are nobodies. So if people are coming to the theater to see these somebodies, then is it not necessarily a problem, but maybe discordant with what the play is doing or trying to do. And yeah, like you said, there've been plenty of big productions. I don't think you named the Ben Cumberbatch one also. Oh, the course, National Theater. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, like there is a, there's precedent for this play being used as a star <laughs> vehicle, even if, as Liam's pointing out, maybe that's not the best use of this particular text in, in at least his view. I, I and I'm I find that question compelling, but I have I think a slightly different retort to it than what yours is, mm-hmm. and uh, and this could just be me, and I will totally concede that might be the case. But I love Lord of the Rings. I love both of these guys. I can't name a single other movie I've seen with either of these guys. I'm sure they have both had very robust careers. I, I'm looking at their credits on here. They certainly have. I don't think I've seen any of these other credits. <laughs> and like, I, I yeah. would struggle to name another movie I've seen with them. And even if there's like a, something in this list, like, oh, I saw that movie. I don't remember them being in it. Mm-hmm. And I, I apologize to Dominic Monaghan and Billy Boyd, who've had very robust careers in film and stage. Uh, but to me, they aren't really celebrities. And again, I think that comes from my position that they weren't the draw for me to go see this production. Tom Stoppard mm. was the draw for me to go see this production. But I, I recognize that for a lot of people, including Mac, including probably you to a certain extent, to including a lot of like the, your friends that you went with, tons of people in the audience around me, the celebrity status of these two hobbits was the draw. Mm-hmm. But they're also, you know, it's not Frodo and Sam doing Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. It's Merry and Pippin. They're already kind of marginal characters <laughs> That's so in the, true. In the <laughs> thing they're most famous for. <laughs> and like, you know, they're prominently featured in it and it's a big deal to have them. And yeah, it certainly, I think, yeah, it did get a lot of butts in the seats. But I, as much as there is certainly a dimension of celebrity attached to their casting in this, I don't think it's as pronounced as a celebrity uh, appearance or stunt casting in any way that I see this critique, a, a very well reasoned critique, in my opinion, that Liam's raised here, but I don't necessarily see it as being as discordant or as much of a tension with the themes of the play as the question itself presents it as being. I recognize that there certainly is a celebrity dimension and that celebrity ness had a huge impact in. This, you know, 1966 Tom Stopper play getting such big audiences in Halifax and Toronto right now. But but <laughs> yeah, I don't I'm not bothered by it, even if I can recognize why it might bother some. And to me, yeah, it's just that as far as celebrities goes, these are kind of the ideal celebrities to take on this role. Benedict Cumberbatch, Daniel Radcliffe, maybe not because they're just so famous and so right. prominent in the things that they're famous from. But I, I think. Yeah, Mary and Pippin is sort of the, if you're going to get a celebrity version of Rosencrantz Gilster, I think they're the perfect celebrities for it. And they did such a great job, even if there were things about the production that I didn't care for. I think, yeah, I'm very happy with them in it. And I don't think it undercuts the themes as much as others might say it might. 
that's my piece on that. I think that's a great point. Yeah, no, that makes absolute sense. I totally didn't. Again, I don't, <laughs> as you're doing a lot for me today, I didn't think of that aspect of like, it's Mary and Pippin. It's not Roto and Sam. That's very... Yeah. It's very not good. McKellen and Stewart. Like, they're, right. They're yeah. <laughs> and like the two of them did a Waiting for Godot production together, and that's fine. Vladimir and Estragon aren't Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. They're not already the side characters from another. Mm -hmm. And like keeping in mind that Tom Stoppard made Rosencrantz and Guildenstern famous. They were already characters in Hamlet, but prior to 1966, most right. productions of Hamlet would cut them out because Hamlet is a very long play. If you were to do the full Kenneth Branagh version of it, it's like four hours long. And most productions have to make cuts somewhere. And before mm -hmm. Tom Stoppard, it would just be a given that we don't need these guys. If we're going to economize this play, we can write a version without them. But after Tom Stopper, people are expecting to see them, which is now you'd be hard pressed to see a production of Hamlet that cuts them out entirely. And then you get things like The Lion King, where Timon and Pumbaa are, you know, when people do like the side by side, what is Hamlet about The Lion King? Timon and Pumbaa are often said that's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I must have forgotten the scene where Simba has them murdered. Oh, well, but and, and then of he course, is a lion. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, there's Lion King one and a half, which is the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead mm -hmm. version of the Lion King mythos. But but yeah, like. <laughs> I don't as much as the joke of the original 1966 play is these are two people who you probably are aware of, but also maybe have forgotten about in Hamlet if you, your encounters with it are on in from productions that cut them out entirely. <laughs> then, yeah, like they are more famous than they would have been in 1966 mm -hmm. now because Stoppard and this play in particular made them famous. And, you know, the joke is still thematically within the play that they are nobodies, but they're not anymore maybe right they don't they don't need to be like as a whole treated as the minor characters because yeah. this play just by existing doesn't treat them as the minor characters exactly so yeah I, I am okay with casting celebrities and once again i think they're the ideal celebrities for it yes yeah it's so good <laughs> <laughs> okay i think we're coming up on the end here i actually thought of something else that i was going to add to our sequence of questions but then forgot yeah. to when i wrote them up I, I meant to double check this and apologies if I'm incorrect about some of these things, but this production ends in a way that I don't believe the original textual version necessarily. And I could be wrong and I regret that I didn't have a chance to check this. Right. But the yeah. fact that we return to the opening sequence of them flipping coins together, to my recollection, I don't think that was in the original and somebody get in the comments and tell me if I'm wrong. Okay. So, so from what I can see, it does not end that they go back. Yes. So let's talk about that, because that's possibly, even if it's not necessarily unique to this production, but that is a choice to, you know, they are dead. Mm -hmm. Canonically, they are dead. It's in the title. We've been told from the beginning and they get executed in England. And we, we are, this production ends with the, the scene, the final scene of Hamlet with Fortinbras and the English ambassador coming in and the English ambassador announces that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. And then we, credits. but then we cut to it's in the theater, so there's no cutting, but then we go back <laughs> to the same tableau from the beginning of the play of them flipping coins, sitting on a log together. So what do you make of that, the, this implication of circularity that this production at least is certainly giving to us as something to the final thought that we send, they send us home with? Mm -hmm. uh, I have to give credits for this to Alex Verge because they had pointed out that it kind of, it, it's a nice way to end it because it kind of, hammers home that like idea of this we're always reliving our struggle with mortality mm -hmm. which i did which i thought was a brilliant observation that they had made because throughout the play rosencrantz and guildenstern are kind of coming to terms with their situation and inevitably have to kind of come to terms with the fact that they are going to die um rosencrantz builds yeah, it's a, a billy boy yeah, Guildenstern. <laughs> yeah, Guildenstern. Okay, great. Uh, Guildenstern is forever going on about like death and what death looks like and what death is. Um, and at one point, uh, Rosencrantz is like, you ever think about lying in a box? Yeah. Um, so it's like that idea of like coming to terms with one's own life and one's own mortality and how we struggle with that daily. And Alex had pointed out by going back, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. They're kind of becoming even more of an everyman to the audience where we can relate to the struggle they go through and we can relate again about they go through that again we go through it 
daily, monthly, weekly, whatever it is. And, you know, the next generation after us will probably go through that again and again. So I, I think it was a very clever choice, especially having Alex Verge's kind of thought on that and how that kind of comes across. And it also adds this level of meta theatricality because I was asked by Alex, so how long have they been doing this? And I'm like, ooh. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, is it every production? Yeah. How long do they restart the play? Is it every, is this meant to be every production of Hamlet or is it what I would, what I kind of guessed is the first cycle they did, it was the first performance of this production. Mm -hmm. And then everyone since has been a new cycle. I don't know. Right. Yeah. No, and it is interesting because I think it definitely does heighten the meta theatricality of Rosencrantz and Gillenstern die night after night after yeah. night in every production of Hamlet that includes them and every production of Rosencrantz and Gillenstern. <laughs> and as fictional characters, they are imbued with a sense of mortality that they will constantly be revived by, and you know, the play ends and then it'll happen again the next night and new actors will take it on and they exist on the page. They aren't confined to the apparatus of squishy flesh the way that those of us who aren't fictional characters are. <laughs> they, they get to temporarily embody <laughs> avatars of squishy flesh, but then they continue to exist after. <laughs> um, and, you know, Billy Boyd and Dominic Monaghan, knock on wood, will die eventually, but Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, contrary to what happens in the play, will not die because another production will always come along that'll bring them back and it'll repeat over and over and over again for as long as people continue to produce and even read this play. Mm -hmm. So I, I do, I like it as a, a stylistic flourish. Why I may be a little, I think you've been using the word lukewarm so much in this production, but why that's kind of how I feel is like I, everything I like, I also have a, but also thought about there. is it, and this is why I wasn't certain if this was in the original text or I didn't recall if it was because it almost makes it too Beckettian or too much like okay. the work of Samuel Beckett because, you know, taking Waiting for Godot as example, the, you know, the very famous you know, the the often quoted line from an early review of Waiting for Godot is that it's a play where nothing happens twice. Because act one, they wait for the guy, he doesn't show up. Act two, they do it all over again, and he still doesn't show up. And, you know, they say, are we going to maybe finally kill ourselves? We'll bring Roke tomorrow if he doesn't come. And the, the final stage direction of both acts of the play is... Or they say, shall we go? Yes, let's go. They do not leave or they do not go. Mm -hmm. And so it it implies that it's a, there's a circularity to it over and over again. We see the the same, essentially the same act of waiting twice with the knowledge that they will come back tomorrow and it'll keep going over and over again. It's Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the mountain just to have it roll back down, which was the example that Albert Camus used when he coined the term absurdism mm -hmm. from Greek mythology. So there is, and Eslin talks about this in his book at all, uh, quite a bit, The this idea of circularity, repetition, things never will end, and that's what makes it absurd, that there is no movement towards closure or finality, even in this play where there it is literally beginning with the title, these guys are going to die, and ends with them dying, it is creating the sense of cyclicalness, and again, another Beckett example is Beckett's play, titled Play, mm. the Beckett oh. play play, <laughs> where... It, it literally ends with the stage direction repeat play. So you do the whole thing over and over again, not with slight variations like the two acts of Waiting for Godot, but just literally do the whole play again. The three actors in urns monologuing when the spotlight hits them, you have to do the exact same thing again. And presumably when you get to the end of the second cycle, you get to that same stage direction repeat play and you would have to do it again. Most productions of play do it twice and you get the idea that it would continue over and over again. <laughs> um, so part of me, while I think, yeah, there's a lot of great thematic richness to this circular movement of it and implying circularity and it really does fit the fictional status of characters like Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, it, to me, it seems just a little too cloyingly, look, we're doing Beckett. Do you get that we're doing Beckett? <laughs> Beckett did this. This is an absurdist play. Therefore, this does thing Beckett does. And Again, I like it, but part of me, and again, maybe it's just because I'm so familiar with a lot of these frames of references that they're clearly drawing from. People who don't bring those same familiarities might be like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. But to me, I just feel like, yeah, I get it. I get it. It's fine. I like it. Do I love it? Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> I don't Fair. Know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Thoughts on any of that? 
Uh, I, I I definitely see why you can kind of go like, oh yes, we're just making it look more like the the not movement, but like the plays before it have done by ending it that way. I certainly see that, but I think I almost I I don't think I am bothered by it simply because I think if it was done to a different play, I'm and I knew that it famously is like no, it's supposed to end there. I would agree, even though I kind of wasn't sure in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Turner Dead. However, I just think that it suits it so much because of the frame of the show that I think it just adds as opposed to it looks like copying mm -hmm. for me, even though, yeah, I, even though I do enjoy play, even though I don't like Beckett, I do enjoy play and that idea of like the repetition. Yeah. yeah I just like the idea of like it's characters forever stuck in the most famous play in the world having to die over and over and over and over and yeah. over, over again. And I think that just kind of hammers it home in a way that I think without it or without that repetition or call or cut to the beginning, I think if it was omitted, it wouldn't have this like kind of jarring effect. Yeah. So I think I just, I, I have to admit that I did really uh, enjoy that kind of inclusion, even though it does call on place past. Yeah. It just, wraps it up and kind of drives home the point a little bit nicer. And I'm inclined to agree with you. And like, that's why I don't think this is a major critique, but it's just something that I think of. There's also yeah. like a rich tradition in theater scholarship and specifically things with Hamlet in particular that really makes a lot of hay out of a one very minor line in Hamlet near the beginning <laughs> when I, either Horatio or Marcellus or one of the guys who encounters the ghost at the beginning says, has he come again tonight? Referring to the ghost, mm -hmm. I forget the exact line paraphrasing here, but a lot of theater scholars like Herbert Blau and Marvin Carlson have, you know, read into that line a lot that this is a meta theatrical joke that the ghost has come again tonight just like he came last night when we did the it's show. Always, uh, yeah. and, and it is sort of uh, yeah, signaling this repetitious nature of theater within the play itself. And, you know, and Hamlet being such a meta theatrical play and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead being an even more meta theatrical mm -hmm. take on that. Like, I I think it suits it here. I just, yeah, I, I wish to me it didn't seem so obviously aping something else, I guess. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can totally see that your knowledge has done you dirty here. I can't enjoy things anymore because I know too much. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I enjoy most things. And this, I, for all of my, you know, little nitpicks and gripes with this production, that was a minor one. Mm -hmm. certainly. And, yeah. and, and, and you'd said that you really, really enjoyed this play in Stoppard. So I guess, like you said, it's that that uh, idea of like, you know, I, I expect so much that like yeah. when it doesn't meet that, it feels even more like a disappointment so which yes, is why i'm a little that. embarrassed that i don't remember if that actually was inherent to the original and <laughs> didn't have a chance to look it up <laughs> i will also say as much as i do love this play it's not even my favorite tom stopper play arcadia is the best play i've ever encountered ever but <laughs> and I, I like a lot of other tom stopper plays a lot more than this one it still has a very special place in my heart it's the first stopper play i think i ever encountered but yeah it is uh yeah these things do i guess yeah impinge upon my capacity to enjoy it unfortunately mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> eh, such is life yeah so those are all the questions i had were there any other last thoughts or other topics you want to raise before we wrap this up i don't think i have any other topics other than like you know if you know who, who whoever is watching this if you are watching it before the show is closed in toronto go see it i think it's at least worth <laughs> Yeah, I think it is worth the Mervish price, if being completely honest. <laughs> sure. get, get a same-day rush ticket if, yes, you're that's, that's, fence, that's it. if yeah. they're still available at this time. Yeah, there's a few days left to see it. Again, this is running until April 6th, I had it written here. Yes, yes April 6th at the CAA. It's also because this was a touring production from Neptune Theater in Halifax. Perhaps they will revive it somewhere else or in a different city. So if you're watching this in the lead up to a different iteration of this production, deciding whether or not to see it, I hope we've given you a lot to think about to keep yourself informed in that purchasing decision and <laughs> and if you're you know the wise person who stopped after the spoiler and then came back to listen to all of this <laughs> thank you for coming back and <laughs> participating in this discussion with us feel free to get in the comments if there's anything you'd like to add we'd love to always hear from people and keep these dialogues going so that's i guess it for rosencrantz and guildenstern are dead they are dead but wait they're back flipping coins <laughs> heads, <laughs> heads. <laughs> so andrew thank you so much for joining me for this discussion this is a very rich uh piece i'm so happy that i was able to have you and your insight on this production on 
Where can people find and follow you if they want to keep up with all of your theater and personal shenanigans? For sure. Uh, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. I always enjoy discussing with you and I enjoyed discussing something that you were lukewarm about that I was decidedly yes. less lukewarm about. We balanced more. each other out. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. There we go. You were warmer. Um, I was lucre. <laughs> that's it. Hey, we got it. We yeah. got it. If you want to find me, you can find me on Instagram, andrew.s.guaru. That's if I'm doing anything where I'm likely to post it. Other than that, uh, you can probably find me here on the cup in yes. some time. <laughs> I think we have another episode coming up that you are already scheduled to be I on. I am indeed, so, yes. Uh, if, if you love Andrew and his theater thoughts, yeah, subscribe, uh, like, share, subscribe to All Things The Cup. <laughs> Follow us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, not calling it the other thing, and Instagram. We are at COH Theater on all of those platforms. <laughs> How we are Cup of Hemlock Theater on YouTube, where you might be watching this, and the Cup of Hemlock Theater podcast and all the podcast places where you might be listening to this with your ears. Thank you so much for joining us, Andrew. Once again, this has been a pleasure. And until next time, I raise my cup to you. Cheers.